one of our top business leaders. Can you figure out how to unmute your phone? I love it that there's somebody more technically challenged than I am. Right now, he's screaming at all of us to go to hell. I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Okay, folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in here for our COVID collab. I don't even know what number this is. I'm losing track of time down here in my basement bunker, but uh, excited to welcome back to the podcast, Bryce Ward, Grant Keir, Susan Hay Patrick, and we are joined by a special guest, President and CEO of First Security Bank, Scott Burke. Scott, thanks for joining us today. You bet. I'm happy to. So you are, you know, we talk about our medical providers as being on the front lines. You are on the front lines of the economic recovery and a lot of this relief effort that's being pushed out from the from the federal government. A lot of the administration of the CARES Act happens through local banks. So what what kind of things are you seeing in 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 your branches? Well, um, as an essential business, my first question was, is what are we going to do with all of our staff when we close our doors? Well, we found something to do with them with the, uh, with the, uh, now that the loan programs have been issued, it has been, um, absolutely a barrage and it's, it's, it's a good barrage because we have a bunch of our businesses around town and, and individuals that, need help. And that's kind of what a community bank's supposed to be there for. So it has been quite an eye opener. And uh, we have, you know, opened the doors really to this program last Friday, uh, about 11 o'clock at night. And since that time, it is, um, it's, it's been going a little bit crazy. And what's interesting is, as every day passes, things seem to change slightly with the program. So Every day we're getting a clearer picture of how this will be processed and how the plan could ultimately and will ultimately work. But since then, I think as of today, um, we're just slightly under, oh, slightly under 800 approved applications and right around $100 million in loans that we've approved. Wow, $100 million. So, and are these loans, these loans are part of the CARES Act? And, and maybe talk a little bit about how um, how that works. It flows through the SBA. I don't know how many people know what the SBA actually is. Um, maybe outline kind of some of the process, if you could. Got it. Um, yeah, this is one of the programs that are, are part of the CARES Act. There's a disaster relief loan which is also through the SBA. That's a direct loan with the SBA. And then they call, uh, what's called the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, is what's being administered for the SBA through the banking system throughout the United States. And um, the way it works is, is the, the program is, uh, is, is basically um, there to get employees, employers to get employees back to work. Um, this loan, um, is put together to help fund payroll expenses and related expenses. Parts of the loan can be used to fund interest on debt, um, lease, uh, your, your rents, leases, and your utilities. So, um, we came into it without a lot, not a lot of guidance. And like I said, every day we're learning, um, the frustrating part about you know, any program, whether it's administered through the federal government or not. What's interesting on this one, there's three agencies that are involved. It's the Treasury Department, the Unemployment, and the SBA. Um, but the SBA is the main agency. But it, it, um, it, it's working. Um, what The way this program works is a two-year program. It's a loan. That's a two-year loan. Um, the first six months uh, payments on that loan is being paid for by the SBA. There are no fees related to this. The rate on the loan is 1%. And based on a formula that they've put together, a portion or all of the loan could be forgiven at the end of eight weeks. So the program was set up to cover basically two months worth of payroll and certain operating expenses. And so, as you can imagine, these loans and they're to small businesses and entrepreneurs. And um, as of today, it opened up to sole proprietorships and contractors. 
Um, they're all over the board in terms of size, in terms of need. So it's been been quite interesting. It's, it's got us hopping, and uh, I, I think I think we're proceeding down a really good path right now. Scott, this is Grant. I just want to say, um, from MEP's perspective, what we've been hearing from colleagues around the region and across the country, it really feels and looks like we're doing a pretty extraordinary job in Missoula of being organized, ready for community businesses and getting these loans out the door. I'm curious, knowing that First Security Bank is part of Glacier Bank Core and you have colleagues around the region, do you have any sense of sort of the scale of how we're doing here in Missoula, both in terms of need and delivery compared to some other places around the region? Yeah. Um, I, I got to say, I, I have to compliment my crew here at the bank because First Security Bank in Missoula here, we have been a preferred SBA lender for many, many years, over 30 years. Um, and so we have that knowledge. It's embedded in it. Uh, we, we, for a long time, we were the number one SBA lender in the state of Montana. Glacier Bank Corp is today the number one uh, SBA lender in the state. So that knowledge has really helped us through this. Um, for some banks that did not necessarily utilize the SBA, the Small Business Administration, uh, not having that knowledge base is, a, is probably a disadvantage in some respects. So I, I think we're doing a really good job. If you look at like Missoula, we are one of 16 divisional banks owned by Glacier Bank. At today, I haven't got updated numbers as of yesterday. I think we're around Oh, a couple of thousand application, approved applications for, we're starting to approach the $1 billion mark in terms of dollars of loans. Well, if you think of that, you know, with us being around 800, a uh, little, little over 800 of those applications, we're making up nearly 45% of everything that Glacier's uh, been able to put together. So mm -hmm. I think in Missoula, um, we're done up, we've, we're doing a really really good job. I'm really proud of my crew because they've been they've been in here Saturdays and Sundays and late at night and they're doing it for the most part with a smile on their face because they are doing what they're really good at and that's helping helping our our customers and that's uh, that's the bottom line. Yeah, let's talk about that from like a culture and leader, leadership standpoint. I mean, you've got employees that are some of them, most of them are having to come to work, come to the office and being inundated with work to help the community. And I'm sure a lot of the folks that are coming in to take advantage of these programs are panicked. They're in an emergency. They're worrying about mm -hmm. losing their business, losing their livelihood, losing their customers. If I have to lay off employees, they are in desperate need of help. How have you approached sort of mobilizing your, 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 your workforce, um, from a leadership standpoint, getting people ready for the challenge that's uh, that's in front of them. Well, it in in my role, in it, it is simply reminding them of the culture that this bank has kind of created since its inception, and that it, that is that we we are we try and are very involved in the community, and the reason for that is. The community is why we have any success whatsoever. So it's a basic culture, but we, we try to live it day in and day out. And in times like this, it just is so apparent. I mean, seeing these people, everybody for the most part, but there's certain individuals that just stand out when they are faced with a challenge like this. And I'm talking about members of my staff. These aren't all just senior managers. It's across the board from hourly staff all the way through my uh, management associates. It's so fun to watch and so fun to see how they're just taking it by the reins and doing it in a manner in which it's helping others and they're getting a lot of pleasure out of that. So um, from my point of view, I, I kind of feel at times like, what the heck do they need me around here because of the technical people with the technical skills are making this happen on the back end. What I'm spending my time in doing is talking to our customers. Um, those of us that I say don't have the technical skills in putting these loans on the system and funding them and so forth, we are all calling our customers just to reassure them that we're here. Um, we can't answer all your questions. We wish we could. Um, 
if we hear something new, we'll let you know, but uh, we're here for you and we'll process your application, do the best we possibly can to get those monies in your hands. So that's, that's it. I'm kind of a cheerleader right now. Yeah, as you should be. Um, and how fast is this <laughs> happening? Like how fast are you able to get the money into the hands of the people that uh, need to put um, it to work? We uh, started our fundings today. So uh, this was launched last Friday, as I said, about 11 o'clock at night. It crashed on us, so we didn't get back and going at it until about 3 in the morning. So in less than a week's time, um, we're finally funding our first loans. So I don't know where we're at today. I know we've funded well over 100 loans today, and we're going to continue that tomorrow. I've heard my first comment was, there is no way I'm going to ask any of these people the week to work over the Easter Sunday mm. or the Easter weekend. I've had so many employees come to me and say, do you think we could come in on Saturday? Wow. Yeah. And so that's what we're doing. We have a crew that wants to come in tomorrow. We're going to be in here. Um, and the reason there's some urgency there is um, one of the rules, which we found only two days ago, um, it wasn't clear in the, in the original uh, program structure, is once we have approved a loan and we have a loan number from the SBA, we have 10 days to fund that. So some of those applications that we're taking last Friday or booking or getting approval last Friday, we got to get uh, get those things booked first uh, first of the week. So we started, like I said, there's money getting into people's accounts today. It'll continue tomorrow and then throughout sure. the rest of the month. How does that compare to like a regular loan cycle? How accelerated is this? Uh, oh, this is. This is this is remarkable how how fast. Um, okay. I, I think the reason Justin for it is in terms of the underwriting um, requirements on this, it's not as vigorous as it would be on just a normal commercial type business loan. Mm -hmm. And SBA has allowed us. Our federal regulators have allowed us. All of the agencies that oversee us are giving us some leniency and latitude in um, not necessarily, I'm not going to say not crossing every T or dotting every A, but just some of the regulatory um, issues that we typically have to deal with that are giving us some latitude to set that aside and get this money out there. Sure. I'll bring Bryce into the conversation. Bryce, I know we've talked on various occasions about the relief package, You know, whether it's a, a first step and to what degree it's a successful first step. You know, what are some of the holes you've seen in the package that maybe, you know, are going to affect how, how Scott and his team and peers sort of administer some of these programs? You, you, can you speak to that in any regard? Well, I'm actually just curious uh, from Scott, you, you've given us very positive numbers about how much you've succeeded in getting out, but have there been people that haven't been able to get loans? Um, yes, there are, there are some that, um, different qualifications in regards to SBA that just don't qualify sometimes in terms of size, sometimes in terms of industry, they're just not under the normal, um, um, what an SBA would, would, would allow under their programs. Um, there are also, I'll be really honest with you, with all of you is that, you know, some of these loans, you know, we're putting a loan together for a business to go out and hire their employees back or keep their employees employed. But what do you, what do you tell one of our bars and restaurants in town that, okay, here's this loan. Um, you, you can't open your doors, but hire back your employees, which are already on unemployment. So there's confusion there. Yeah. But on the flip side of it, um, if you step, take a step back, um, until some of these things are more clear when our businesses can start opening their doors again, this is 1% money. A lot of business uh, men and ladies are saying, I'll take the risk, I'll borrow the money. I may not spend the money, but at least I have it and I know what I can do with it once my door is open, if my door is open. If not, I got the money and I'll pay it back. So there are, I'll tell you, there's some clients that have qualified that have said, no, not now. I, I just not ready to take it. And I understand that. I totally understand that. Have you seen any businesses that have actually shut down already and just said, we're done. We're not even going to bother. Yeah. 
Yeah, sadly we have. Hmm. Any how and any sense of, of the are, magnitude some, some of, of these? Um, not at this point. It's too early to tell. Not huge, but there are some businesses that are extremely cyclical, seasonal, and cyclical that cannot weather when they've lost. You know, if they were a business that made all their revenue in the spring and that is now gone and they cannot survive until next spring when that main source of revenue starts flowing again. Those are the type of business pretty much just calling it quits. And there's not a ton, but there's, it, it's sad. It, there's a few that just uh, kind of breaks my heart. Yeah. And how is this playing out in the, um, in the nonprofit space, you know, Susan, are any of your, your, your other fellow nonprofit leaders taking advantage of, are they able to take advantage of some of these lending programs and, and can these be administered through Scott and his team? How's that play out? Yes. Um, most of the nonprofits that I've been speaking with over the last couple of weeks have intended or have applied for um, PPP. Uh, I heard I'm on a state level task force for the Montana Nonprofit Association, and I heard that some of the food pantries are just so beleaguered and overwhelmed with requests that they haven't had time to apply. And of course, they're among the organizations that might need assistance the most. It wasn't as straightforward. I noticed, Scott, on the application, for example, when it asks you like who the owner is and what your ownership interest is, yeah. um, the, the, the forms are really more designed for the business community. But we, we muddled through it. And it, I do see that uh, there is tremendous uncertainty right now in the nonprofit sector. Folks are drawing on cash reserves. Um, they are continuing to ask for money. They're waiting for uh, the payroll protection program, but they're not sure, many of them, how they're going to make it uh, in that four to eight week expected delay you know, between the time they get approved and the time they get money. And uh, some of them have reported those that rely on stores, you know, secondhand stores or um, stores as an earned income. Uh, one of them reported to me that they've lost nearly 100% of their income. And of course, they're these. this is fundraising season. I think we talked about that last week. So folks have had to cancel their events or move them online. There's a lot of creativity uh, going on, but mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of fear and uncertainty right now about whether those nonprofits will be able to make it. So Scott, you've got such a volume of people coming in. And like we said before, these, these people are, you know, fighting a ton of battles on a variety of fronts on their side. Uh, what would advice be from you for somebody to be successful and efficient in approaching First Security or, or, or any peer bank, you know, when you're sort of walking through the metaphorical door right now? How do you prepare yourself for success and efficiency as somebody coming in for funding? Do your homework. Um, get on the sba.gov website. That information is the best information you'll get. Um, early on in the process, there, it, wasn't as, uh, it, it wasn't as robust as it is now, but there's some really good information out there now. Read through it. Understand what qualifies. Understand what doesn't qualify. Um, the application itself is, is a simple two-page application. Uh, that won't be it, but understand what will qualify. And my suggestion would be is turn to your accountant or your CPA to help you put that supporting documentation together. That, it will, that will assure things are going to go through very quickly. Um, uh, we've just seen where people are putting an application together and they turn in the application with no supporting documentation. You kind of go all right, um, are you sure this, you know, are you confident that this money will be forgiven because we can't look at, you know, anything to support it? So that's it. Just make sure you have a clean application. You understand what qualifies and what's not. Use your professionals in your business uh, life, your accountants, to help you put the information together, and I think it'll go very smoothly. And I assume this is rolling, right? Like, there's, there was an amount yeah. allotted. People are coming in, and, and and when it runs out, we either have something, some additional package, but that's yet to be seen. So don't wait is, is the message, I think, too, right? Agreed. Agreed. And and just to play off of what um, 
Susan said also, you know, typically nonprofits were not allowed to to apply for loans through the SBA or, or apply for their guarantee. This has been unique. So this has been really cool that they opened it up and they opened it up to 501c3s. And so this has been great. And Susan, that's probably why the application is what it is. It's, it's, it's been used for the business side more than anything. Right. Well, we're, we're grateful to be invited to the party. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott, thanks so much for stopping by and sharing some of your, your, your view from the, the, the economic front lines. And thank you for all the work you do and all the call, all of your colleagues at, at First Security to, um, to administer these programs and help people get the the funding and the relief they need. So we really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. We're happy to do it. And I got to give kudos to my banking associates throughout the town. They're doing a good job also. Awesome. Well, until next time, we're going to break down some other uh, aspects of the story. Scott, you can feel free to hang out and chime in or or go on to uh, go back to underwriting or whatever you need to do. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all. So um, we're going to transition to Justin Bruce here in a minute. But before we do, um, I wanted to circle back to kind of some stuff we talked about in the beginning or, or didn't quite have a chance to talk about in the beginning. But, um, you know, Bryce, it seems to me we're in an interesting period in the sense that there's going to emerge uh, debate over the facts and the narrative associated with those facts. There's some reason to be optimistic uh, that we're flattening the curve Leaders are sort of talking more optimistically about the timeline to, quote, reopen the economy. Um, what's your take on all of that talk and, and the prospects of, of making some changes along those lines? Um, so, I mean, you know, certainly the data suggests that we're, suppression is, we're succeeding at suppression. You know, the, the rate of growth gets lower and lower pretty much every day, pretty much at every place you know, with little hiccups here and there, but so that, you know, that part is working. The, the challenge of course is, well, are we ready to move into the next step? Because basically what we have to do to quote, reopen the economy, even in some limited form is we have to be able to do what we failed to do in January and February, which is identify cases, uh, trace their contacts and quarantine anybody who might be affected. And, while we know that that's what we need to do, it's not at all clear, and I'm not saying I know one way or the other, it's just not clear uh, that we have the capacity in place to do those things in an, even an idealized world, right? So do we have the testing capacity we need? And that includes, you know, that's there's multiple pieces to that. There's all the actual equipment you need to test. There's the people that you need to collect the samples and there's the people that you need to process the samples and do we have all the capacity that we need to do that and then okay so great once we get people tested and you have a positive test can we then identify everybody that you've come in contact with and of course today this is friday so apple and google just announced that they're going to try and do this with your smartphones Mm. of course privacy advocates and you know, civil liberties people are going to be like, do we really want to do this with our smartphones? Um, so you're going to have some issues about that. And then just on the public health side, do we have enough people with enough training to be able to do it without the technology or in complement with the technology? And then can we actually quarantine all the people that we need to quarantine? And that's all, those are all just the idealized steps. And then you add the behavioral la- layer on top of that, which is if I get sick, will I get tested? And if somebody tells me that I've been in contact, will I quarantine myself? And so, you know, we know what we need to do, but it's not clear that if we said, okay, we want to open up the economy uh, at the end of May or whenever it might be, that everything will need to be in place so that we don't end up right back where we are now, we'll be able to actually execute that. And so that's what we're trying to look for. And we're trying to get some sense of what we're going to actually do because there's lots of different plans and can we actually execute it in a way that works? And if we can, then that's great. Then we get to come out of our little caves and I won't say we'll go back to normal, but we'll go back to something where we're not all sitting at home every day. Yeah. One of the interesting things there too, is that, you know, this, this kind of, 
narrative that emerges, right? Like these forecasts change and they change based on what we do. We all shelter in place. We take social distancing seriously and the forecast for how bad it could be, it ends up not being as bad as, as we thought it could be. And that's not because we overestimated how bad it could be. It's because, you know, what, what we called for people to do actually worked. And it seems like we're in a moment where there's some risk to losing our vigilance, right? We got to sort of see this thing through. A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hi, this is Anya Jabor, Regents Professor of History at the University of Montana, and you are listening to A New Angle. Grant, what do you feel like, what's the tenor of the conversation in the business community? Has it changed? Has it become more optimistic, less optimistic? What are you hearing out there? You know, I think what we're hearing is a, a lot of relief that these loans are finally being uh, distributed throughout the community. Uh, there's a lot more clarity coming out of the SBA program. So I think that there's a lot more comfort from people. I think um, I think what Scott shared is sort of in keeping with what we're hearing. We've done a great job in Missoula, but there are definitely some gaps we're seeing in the system. And I think what we're trying to figure out right now is how big are those gaps, exactly who's following through those gaps and how do we support those folks who are not um, already in line for these loans or teed up to get them, or perhaps have businesses that aren't qualified for these loans. And there are a few of those in our community and figuring out what we can do to be supportive of those too. So I think um, I think it depends what business you're in, but I think people are starting to feel a little more comfort that if this doesn't last too long, some of these programs are going to work. I think there's some hope that these uh, conversations about extending or expanding funding so that if the funding in this first phase where, uh, runs out, there'll be additional funds to some of these programs. But I think there, this, this sort of level of uncertainty about when we can return to something like a functional economy remains a real sort of looming question and I think uh, a source of stress for a lot of people. Well, you know, hints of optimism in there. And one of the things in this whole situation that makes me super optimistic is stories of innovation of how businesses reinvent themselves, uh, rethink what they do, adapt, show agility, get creative. And, and one, one such business is, is Coaster Cycles. And we're, we're excited to have Justin Bruce, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Coaster Cycles, join us. Uh, Justin, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks very much. Nice to meet you. So, I mean, you can lay out the facts, but my understanding is that, you know, you, you sort of experienced a shutdown with demand for your product and realize that, hey, you could retool your manufacturing operation here in Missoula to serve an important need in the medical space. You want to talk us through kind of the the, the roller coaster you've been through? <laughs> yeah, it definitely has been a roller coaster. So about three weeks ago, we ended up having to um, uh, see that all of our businesses, so we have four different businesses between our advertising, our manufacturing, uh, our operations, and then our experiential marketing. And all four of the businesses came to a screeching halt. And we uh, ended up having to uh, furlough and lay off um, close to 90% of our, of our staff. Hmm. And it was the hardest week that I've ever had at work um, in all my career. And it was just something that we needed to, uh, Ben Morris is the CEO and is based out of the Bay Area. And the two of us uh, were connecting all week to try and figure out what we could do and, and what we could do to help. So with our pedicab, so we're, we're a cycle company. We, we basically uh, have built car commercial grade cargo bikes. Uh, we built um, coffee bikes for Starbucks, uh, beer bikes for uh, NFL stadiums, um, and just work, build bikes for quite a few uh, other kind of Fortune 500 companies. And it was something that we had vendors that, um, that, that we could get plastic from and vendors that we could get elastic from and vendors that we could get foam from. And so as we were hearing from hospitals and different groups that there was such a need for face shields, we knew that we could potentially step in and, and help out there. So it goes back to uh, the original engineering firm out of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the company is Delve. They ended up uh, releasing an open source uh, design for a face shield. And we came across it. Ben had sent me the uh, the the link on on LinkedIn, and within six or seven minutes, um, I was calling out to vendors to see if we could get the supplies, and Ben was calling hospitals, 
to see how we can uh, to see who we could supply to. And we worked all weekend, uh, probably 16 to 18 hour days. For the next four or five days, we ended up getting samples out to four different hospital groups. And we eventually got our first order for 500,000. <laughs> wow. And it's, uh, it's actually grown since then. How long does it take to make 500,000 face shields? So we didn't have any idea when, yeah. we, um, when we got this order. <laughs> and it was something that uh, we, we've now done a whole bunch of testing. I, I'm so thankful that I have such an incredible team here that they immediately um, heard about the project and, and jumped right in. Um, and, and help me kind of engineer the jigs and the process. And, um, and, and we, we've fine tuned it today is actually first day of production. And we are, uh, we, we, we were planning on 45 seconds a piece. Um, we're currently down to about 35 seconds a piece. So we are actively hiring, um, and, uh, we're, we're also getting some partners involved. So, uh, last night I was speaking with the owner of Kettle House and they're going to put together a team to help us out. Um, we're also speaking with uh, two or three other companies that are also going to put some teams together, and that should be developed in the next uh, in the coming days. Justin, great work. This is Grant Keir from MEP. Nice to have you on. Uh, I just had a question for you. We had just heard from Scott Burke, the CEO at First Security Bank, and he talked a lot about sort of how their corporate culture helped them really shift into how they responded to this. You talked about your four product lines, and I know your company pretty well. Each of those emerged out of just seeing an opportunity in the business you did and seeing a chance for growth and, and pivoting and adding to the, to the business. I'm wondering if you feel like your ability to sort of pivot on this issue was, was really facing an existential crisis or was, was it really sort of embedded in the culture of your company, if you could reflect on that? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think it's a mix of both. Um, it is something that, you know, we are, uh, we always try and stay um, as in tune with what is needed next. And usually it's been on three wheels. Um, but when it came to this and, and we couldn't really, uh, we, we lost a lot of the clients or they got postponed um, on the bikes, we just were looking for something different. And I think it is in the culture too, that, you know, we, we've always hired people and that want to join our team that are ready to, to when there's a need for something, they want to jump in and they want to create and design something. So that's how we've done it on bikes. When we had Nestle come to us and they wanted a coffee shop on a bike, we had never done anything close to that, but they needed it done in 25 days and we turned it around and it went into a TV commercial. So those are sort of the things when Starbucks, Starbucks comes to us and, and needs, um, instead of just a cold brew coffee bike, they, they need it. Um, with a whole train. <laughs> so we build the train. So we have hot coffee on one bike, then we have a trailer with cold coffee, then we have a trailer with bakery items. So I think it is, there's an excitement around coaster cycles that when there's an opportunity to try something new and to, 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 to come up with a solution, we're, we're the, we want to be the first on it. And all of your manufacturing is, is here in Missoula, out in the sawmill zone. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Our business is spread. We originally started in the Boston area. So we started with Boston Pedicab. I'm from that area. And then um, we launched into different uh, avenues where our advertising is really based out of San Francisco. And then manufacturing, we were looking around the states um, and in uh, and, and Missoula one. So we moved out here five years ago and um, all, all of our manufacturing is done in the Bonner sawmill. So and how what portion of your employee base were you able to bring back to work on these face shields? So we had to lay off 85% um, of our staff uh, that, that is here in, in, um, in Bonner. And we've offered jobs to every single one of them. And we are actively hiring. We're, we were at a crew of about 21 people. Um, and we just hired 15 people today. Um, and we see that trend continuing on. We do think we may have to go to double shifts and potentially Saturdays. Um, but we it's, it's incredible the response we're getting of people you know, not just sending their resumes, but kind of sending a story or sending a couple sentences of how they want to help um, and that they've been looking for something of, of how they can just get this feeling that they can help out and be part of a, a solution for the for what's going on. That's awesome. It must be so great for those for, for you as, as leaders to bring those people back, to give them meaningful employment, to give them the pathways to help. Um, talk about just the spirit of your workforce, these folks that you know, we're passionate about problem solving in, in the in the pedicab space, but have pivoted to uh, to helping out frontline medical personnel. Yeah, I think they just they 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 all um, 
they've all been super excited about bikes, you know, and many of them are, we, we have some fabrication, some welding, some bike assemblers, and then, you know, a number of people in the offices and sales. And they, they all were, you know, super passionate about, about the cycling industry. And I think it's hard not to get incredibly passionate about something when there's such a need right now. So um, two of my managers have, uh, there, one of them has a wife that is a doctor at St. It's St. Pat's in town. Another one is um, works for um, community. So there's there's direct connections uh, to people that wanted to to help out and help out the people in their in their um, significant others fields. So it's it was um, uh, you just saw the passion come on board and everybody was just willing to step in. And um, we had people when they heard of the idea within two hours, they were at the shop with me. And uh, it, it's incredible. Awesome. Would you have any advice? I mean, I, uh, your business is, is unique and you were fortunately in a position to be able to pivot like this, but would you have any advice to other entrepreneurs, business leaders in the community for how to kind of see opportunity in the in the crisis that we're living through right now? Yeah, I think I, I think for us, we we just started reaching out to people and just talking to as many people as we could. And that's where we heard the needs. And, um, you know, there were, there were a number of things for masks and different things that included sewing. And we just don't, we're not capable of doing those sort of things. And we didn't have the, the equipment. So we had to find something of a way that, that would work for us. So it did take us a few days and, uh, we didn't know, you know, we kind of went into it not knowing if it was going to be the right decision. So we, we were working on it for three or four days and basically nonstop and just saying, you know what, Let's just give it everything we've got for one week. And if it doesn't work out, you know, we've just, we've lost a week of time, but we all have time right now, it seems like. So um, I think for, for other entrepreneurs and other companies in, in town, um, I could certainly <laughs> use some of those companies that if they want to partner with me right now and they want to build face shields, I, I, I'm certainly willing to speak with other business owners right now that want to help out. Um, but uh, outside of that, you know, I think it's just, um, just, just speaking with different people and finding out what, um, what, what your team is good at and then seeing what the need is and just seeing if there's, if there's a match. Well, Justin, it's an awesome story. We appreciate, uh, having you as a member of this community and, and being able to, to quickly pivot, to meet the demands of the moment and bring people back to work in meaningful ways. So thanks for doing that. And thanks for coming by and, and sharing a bit of that story. Best of luck. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. So, uh, next pivot, we've got like a murderer's row of awesome guests on this podcast today. Uh, one of my favorite colleagues at the college of business, a professor of management, Michael Braun, and he's also a strategy master. I mean, your book, Mike is called mastering strategy. So I think I can call you a strategy master. Um, you and colleagues, Grant included, are developing this um, this BEAR program. What does BEAR stand for? Business Emergency Assistance and Recovery, right? This is a, a quickly spun up program, uh, co coordination between MEP and the University of Montana to help bring the expertise of the university and the community to BEAR for uh, businesses in need. Mike, you want to speak? First yeah. of all, welcome. And you want to uh, talk a little bit about the BEAR program. Thank you so much, Justin, and um, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, the other thing is uh, just a, a little correction. It's not that we're developing. We have developed and we are live. It's so happening. It's happening. It, it is happening. The business emergency assistance and recovery powered by UM is actually uh, live and we are taking uh, orders, if you will. So what you have to understand is obviously in this um, period of, of economic tur turmoil and, and uncertainty. There's a lot of small businesses and small business owners in Missoula County who are finding that the information that's coming out related to uh, you know what to do in this uh, COVID environment um, is either incomplete or it's scattered, especially as it relates to the CARES Act. Or in other cases, we do have business owners who don't necessarily have access to a dedicated team that can help them navigate um, the, the CARES Act and some of the other resources that they need to actually get the funding and the support um, that's, that's required. So together with the uh, Missoula Economic Partnership and their Missoula County Economic Recovery Task Force, 
the University of Montana developed and launched uh, this BEAR program, BEAR powered by UM. And what it is, folks, is it's a help button. It's a single point of entry uh, for assistance and expertise from business oh, for businesses needing uh, guidance and information. So whether it's uh, SBA or CARES Act loans and um, information uh, related to economic injury disaster loans and paycheck protection programs, obviously other CARES Act questions. Uh, but outside of that, we are also providing access to legal expertise, also general financial questions, and then general business strategy advice. I mean, we're even getting inquiries already from companies that are asking how they can pivot their business model, uh, just because obviously, you know, the old business model has sort of um, been on hold, if not, um, you know, uh, crumbled on them. So um, we do have through the University of, uh, of Montana and Accelerate Montana, we have programs such as the Small Business Development Center, which helps businesses apply for loans via the Small Business Administration, or obviously uh, right now with the CARES Act. Also through the Blackstone Launchpad and the College of Business, we're providing coaching sessions to business owners and entrepreneurs, as well as hosting live interviews, webinars uh, for them to actually get the assistance that they need. Um, there is a button that is up and running. You can find it on the site of MEP. You can find it on the site of Accelerate Montana and shortly also on the College of Business website that when you you know, hit that button, what happens is the first thing is you will be asked to fill out a form that tells us a little bit about what your needs are. And then what we do is we get back to you within 24 hours, either with links to other organizations or resources. We will also have posted information in terms of articles, audio and visual recordings. And then we will also give you uh, specific written responses or referrals to our subject matter experts. So we are quickly building up a group of subject matter experts that includes individuals, programs, and organizations who can be there to answer your questions and provide that support. And then, uh, you know, especially as we find convergence on some of the topics, we will have scheduled live Q&A office hours, if you will, Zoom sessions, where we will have experts and panels who can actually field questions from businesses and business owners. Mike, this is awesome. I mean, you covered all the bases. Um, it's super exciting that folks can can take advantage of this and this great expertise in the community right away. The only thing missing, I think, is some sort of like a bat signal. Do you have a bat signal right? that people can throw up there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think or a bear uh, signal, I guess. The, the bear signal, so the 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 grizzly claw or something. Uh, but you'll see, you know, the 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 button. I'm sure it'll involve. But right now, we just wanted to put it put it out there. It's a red button, so. You know, make sure that you find it and that you hit it, and uh, we'll be as responsive as we can, given your inquiries. Well, awesome, Mike. Thanks for stopping by, telling us all about it. Good luck, and uh, let us know how we can help. Thank you, and thanks for all your work, Justin, and rest of the team. Thanks. Okay, so back to the panel. A lot there to digest. Um, so many people doing awesome work in our community, and uh, it's great to kind of profile some of those stories and the remaining time we have maybe we can kind of just ground truth some of that um you know that great work happening with some of the needs that are out there susan can you give us an update from the the nonprofit space as to what you're seeing as the most salient needs out there and opportunities for people to to pitch in and help out sure um one thing that uh, the other Justin said that really struck with me was they they did this even though he said we went into it not knowing if it would be the right decision. And I just applaud that way of thinking. You know, I, I joke, my staff is so tired of hearing me say this <laughs> at United Way, the answer to how is yes. But it seems like that's what they <laughs> did too. And, um, you know, we jumped into this COVID-19 emergency assistance fund that we started. And so far in last week in this, we will have distributed about $265,000 wow. to service and gig economy workers. And again, we, we thought it was the right thing to do. We were, we sort of were building a bridge to, we didn't know where, but um, we continue to raise funds for that at missoulaunitedway.org. 
as you know, more and more requests for masks are, are coming out since mm -hmm. the CDC asked people to wear masks if they were out and about and with and around other people. So we've had a lot of masks donated from our home seamstresses and seamsters. And uh, there's a bin on our front porch at 412 West Alder where we're collecting masks. Uh, Runner's Edge donated a hundred buffs, um, which are perfect for to, you know, pull up over your face. Indeed. I used one this morning. Out in public. Um, I would say that I would tell people that, you know, we're such a giving community, that's a Missoula value to continue to support the nonprofits that you care about, because they really are um, facing some great uncertainty. And there's some amazing creativity. People are moving things online. The Montana Natural History Center, for example, has a, a whole series that they've started called the, um, the Corona the, the age of Corona Pacine. It's a collaboration between the Natural History Center and the university where they're talking about what are viruses and where did this one come from and why is social distancing important and what does the science tell us? I think that's a really clever thing to do. Mountain Home Montana moving its Mother's Day tea to online. So just continuing to support our nonprofit sector and realize that yes, federal assistance will be coming down for many people, but it's, it's not going to be the answer for everybody. Yeah. I just wanted to sort of echo Susan, quick plug for this age of the Corona Pacine sort of women webinar series. The first of which started uh, this afternoon, but the next installment is Friday the 17th and then uh, Friday the 24th. This is being spun up by biology professor, Eric Green and some of his colleagues. If you're interested in checking that out, it is available at montananaturalist.org slash coronapacine. That's C-O-R-O-N-A-P-O-C-E-N-E. -E. And we'll post a link to that on our social, but an awesome program being spun up uh, by Dr. Eric Green and his colleagues out of the Division of Biological Sciences and Wildlife Biology Program here at the University of Montana. Well, let's reflect a little bit, you know, Grant, I, I'm sorry, uh, Bryce, I, I sort of asked you to ground truth some of the, the data. Um, I mean, what, it, yeah, w w as you're looking at this thing, big picture, where do you think we're at? Are we closer to the end than the beginning? Is it too early to tell? Like, w w what's your basic interpretation of the macro picture right now? Gosh, it's been such an uplifting podcast. You really want me to talk I about know. that? I set you up for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, all these positive things. And now the dismal scientist will come in with uh, his dismal predictions. That's such I mean, an awesome use of dismal scientist. I, I love that. It's a, that was almost a pun, Bryce. Yeah. So, um, I mean, so in terms of where we are in terms of the first phase, which is the initial outbreak and the suppression of the initial outbreak, uh, that I feel like, yeah, we're getting through that. Although mm -hmm. my guess is that we still have a ways to go. As for when do we actually get to move to a partially reopened economy and when we get to move to, you know, life being somewhat normal, that really depends on the scientists, right? Uh, can they, you know, the last piece, do we get a treatment or a vaccine? And obviously they're working really hard and I hear optimistic things, but this isn't easy. And in terms of can we do the test, trace, quarantine piece, we know what we need to do. Uh, and people are building technologies to, that will help us do it. But uh, can we execute that? That's also a big unknown. But, you know, I mean, I, I guess to bring it back to what we've heard from the other guests today is that there's a lot of people out there that are working really hard. And... Uh, I will be an optimist with respect to humans and our ability to solve problems. And, you know, so we will get there. I just don't know when. Well, I think that's a fair assessment that we will get there and not knowing when is, is totally reasonable. Grant, let's, let's uh, reflect on, you know, you, you heard from Justin, you heard from the, from, from Scott, the lender, you know, it seems like we're, we're sort of experiencing some of the, the Missoula resilience and spirit that we sort of 
maybe over the years of growth that we've experienced lately, we've had a hard time articulating, but it, it, it feels to me like, like people are doing the best they can with a really good community oriented intention. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think um, I'm so proud of everything I've seen from our banking and credit union community in terms of stepping up. I think many of our businesses have just, you know, are looking for ways to contribute to solutions to the challenges that we're facing. <clears throat> I'm seeing our leaders in our community, whether it's elected officials or leaders of our big institutions collaborating in ways I've never seen before. Not that they didn't try to work together, but just these deep commitments to communicating regularly and being on the same page and understanding how each other's decisions are impacting one another. So I, I think the reason that we are doing as well as we're doing now is because we have such an incredible collaborative community that has got so much commitment to sort of the general good. I do worry about a little about the thing that you started on, which is that have we done so well that people will start to think that we're through this or that somehow we it wasn't as big a deal as we thought. And right. I, I hope that we'll remain vigilant and be thoughtful and be patient. And I just hope that our federal government, where the only capacity exists to really provide the economic relief to allow us to be patient, we'll continue to collaborate and find solutions so that people can find ways to just survive this phase until we have the, the technical know-how and the science and the capacity to get into that, that phase two that Bryce was suggesting is on the horizon somewhere and we're not sure where yet. Well, I'm optimistic that we can and we'll do it. Uh, let's close as we have been with things that we're stoked about. Susan, why don't you kick it off? What are you, what are you excited about this week? Well, I just love what Grant said, um, about our ability to collaborate and really work effectively together, because I think the more that we step forward to take these kinds of actions, to connect with one another and to be problem solvers and be part of the solution, the more sense of control will begin to feel again over uh, our ability to shape our own destiny. Um, so I'm just excited about continuing that work and doing it with all of you. One foot in front of the other. Yeah. Uh, Bryce, what do you think? Basically this podcast has been kind of some of the most uplifting times I've had this week, right? It's just a lot of very positive things with people doing what, we talked about back on the very first one, which is reach out and figure out how you can help people. And it's nice to hear that the community is stepping up and the university is stepping up and the private sector is stepping up and our banking sector is stepping up. And I know our healthcare sector is stepping up. Uh, and, you know, I trust because we're in Montana and I know the spirit of Montanans that, you know, Montanans are stepping up and helping each other out. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's always the bright side to, you know, a crisis, right? I guess it's the old Mr. Rogers look for the helpers as they're, they'll be there. And it's nice to see that they're actually out there. Indeed. Yeah. Grant, your thoughts on something to be hopeful and, and stoked about. Yeah. I, if I didn't convey it enough, I guess, um, you know, I shared with my staff this week that I am, I am more hopeful now than I have been since this all started. And I, I really, it really is about seeing this all come together in terms of the programs finally being rolled out. You know, there's still headlines about these things not working in many communities across the country. And the fact that they are working here gives me a lot of hope that as a community, we're going to continue to rally and we're going to find ways to roll up our sleeves and work together and bring the resources we need to get through this. So it's not going to be easy. It's still going to be painful. We will lose businesses, but I, I wouldn't want to be in any other community on earth to try to get through this. And I'm really hopeful that Missoulians are doing the right things in all the right ways. Bullish on Missoula. I think we unite on that. Um, I am thankful, and this is a shameless plug for uh, for next week's edition of the podcast. I had an awesome experience yesterday recording with two of my heroes that are also two awesome Missoulians, and that's Jeff Ament and John Wicks. That episode will air on Thursday. Uh, we had an awesome conversation ranging from really deep thoughts about the crisis we're in to how art is made how constraints like the world we're living in and isolation right now can contribute to interesting and dynamic forms of art. 
And yeah, that was a super fun conversation. I was thankful for the opportunity and what those guys and others have done to support um, this podcast because I think it's um, it's become an important platform. And and what um, Bryce Grant and Susan you bring to this conversation is resonating. I think we're providing people with important information, and I thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with me every Friday. And uh, I don't, I certainly don't want it to go on forever, at least not in the current, uh, with the current subject matter, but uh, I'm thankful that we're able to come together and, and uh, do some good for the community. So thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a gift from University of Montana alums, Michelle and Lauren Hansen. And remember that A New Angle is supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you would ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps, executive producer Stefan Borsum, and interns Aspen Runkle and Max Gibson. Huge thanks to VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks for the tunes. And finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word. Be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. <laughs>